Mr. Paul Roberts, you're the only uh, speaker I have signed up right now. So if you give us your name and address for the record as a formality. Uh, Paul Roberts, I live at 812 Hoyt in uh, Everett. And, uh, I, you know, I'm a city council member, but I'm here as a citizen as much as a council member, I guess. Uh, let me start by, because I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank the planning chair for the work you're doing on the streets initiative. Uh, and I did have a chance to attend this uh, last week the uh, Suncadia Regional Conference with Commissioner Tisdale and uh, would just echo the comments he made that uh, of the megatrends that were discussed at the conference, both climate change and demographics, as well as significant changes in the economic structure uh, were all referenced. And of course, those affect us in the Pacific Northwest in, in big, big ways. Uh, so I think that those become appropriate backdrops for the work that we're doing, you're doing, and the update of the comprehensive plan, but in particular on this issue. I think it's interesting to note that the um, the work that uh, the staff has put together uh, talks about these changes that are taking place on a regional level. I think it's important to note that that's what it looks like for one region, but that those consequences, significant storm events, changes in uh, uh, rainfall, in water, in uh, any number of things, and certainly in terms of temperatures, are taking place in every part of the globe. So we're getting to take a look at one piece of our region, but I think it's important to keep in mind that that is happening globally and to the extent that uh, both our uh, economy as well as our community is tied on a global scale, uh, it's probably not, uh, uh, it's something we don't wanna lose. I would start uh, by saying then that I have provided you, uh, one of the hats I wear is as the chair of the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency Board. And uh, Commissioner Tisdale is a part of our advisory board on that agency. That agency, as I think many of you know, but perhaps not everyone knows, that it is really kind of the local enforcement and uh, local agency that deals with the Clean Air Act, uh, the Federal Clean Air Act, and it looks at the region. So it's the four county region, including Kitsap County, as well as Pierce, King, and Snohomish counties. And I just commend this report to you because it addresses not only climate issues and the importance of moving forward as a region, it also addresses a number of other uh, air quality issues. And that's important as we link transportation and land use uh, because it's not just greenhouse gas emissions, it's also the other six regulated uh, uh, up air pollutants that are important for an air quality standpoint. So climate change is one aspect of it, but it's not the only aspect of it in terms of dealing with the linking linkages between land use and transportation. I want to start then uh, just a, a few remarks and I'll try to be brief and respect your time, but I first wanna thank the staff who I think has done uh, really a remarkable job in pulling together a whole lot of information for you and has done, a, in my opinion, has done an excellent job of summarizing lots and lots of information. There is no lack of uh, information on this subject at this point. And the studies that have been referenced to you are really seminal studies on the subject. So uh, great job on the part of the staff. And also, I think the staff did uh, the best they could do in, some, in taking what are huge volumes of information and trying to give you sort of uh, synopsis and, and snapshots of that. Um, in, in regards to that work, I would just make a couple of comments, and my comments are not criticisms of the work, they're simply additional comments that I wish to add to that. One is that the Department of Defense has actually been a leader in this issue for now a number of years, and in the earlier materials that I provided you, I referenced the Quadrennial Defense Review, which is the uh, essential document that the DOD uses to uh, align and plan force structure going forward. 
that document over the course of several iterations now, the most recent of which was this year in 2014, really makes this, uh, uh, this issue pronounced in terms of uh, the threats that exist with this nation. There, it's, it's, it's termed a threat multiplier uh, in terms of the issues that climate change will present globally. And uh, the most recent report was issued last week, which was issued by retired Rear Admiral David Titley, who has been the Pentagon's sort of point person on this. And it deals with adaptation questions and goes into much more, uh, much more in-depth work. So I am happy to provide a link to that if you need that and um, would suggest that it becomes yet another piece of business uh, to underscore the importance of moving forward. I would also point out that in the work that's referenced in Risky Business, that report focuses in a little different way from some of the other pieces that are referenced, whereas the IPCC report or the, uh, the climate assessment uh, looks principally at the issues associated with science. The Risky Business Report issue uh, focuses on issues associated with banking, insurance, and real estate. And I would respectfully suggest that those issues might emerge even more quickly than the scientific ones, because they will force financial decisions to be made that start to account for these changes uh, in all of those areas. And that is now starting to become a pretty significant issue in terms of insurance, banking, and real estate impacts associated with not only sea level rise, but also with storm events and extreme weather events, uh, water, water supply, uh, irrigation and other kinds of issues that uh, will be emerging uh, nationally. And I would also point out that the term that's often used is called king tides, and it's something we've just experienced here just this week or within the last couple of weeks where we see a combination of uh, king tides being a, a situation that exists when the sun, moon, and high tides align, and they bring us the very, very highest kinds of tides. That's where we're likely to see, particularly when you add a storm event, uh, the most significant flooding in, uh, in low areas. So those are just some things to, to um, uh, to be mindful of as you go forward. Again, none of those comments are intended to be criticisms. I think the work that's, that you have received from staff is outstanding. I would say, uh, and I would ask, and my recommendation going forward, is that several pieces be um, somehow incorporated into a plan. I appreciate uh, um, uh, staff's comments that you can't get it all done within this time frame, and that's I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, the issue isn't going to go away. I think we're going to have time to revisit and, and revise and improve. But I do think that there are several key elements that probably need to be part of this work going forward. Uh, to me, I think first and foremost is, um, and I think Commissioner Sand can identify with this as much as any of the members, is that you cannot manage what you do not measure the old public works adage, and I think it's important, therefore, that some kind of structures that help us measure uh, what we're go doing going forward uh, is important to put into place. Um, if it can't be completed now, at least get it done so that as we make decisions or make assessments or or have policies, we're able to try to at least reasonably ascertain what the impacts of those will be in terms of reducing greenhouse gas or addressing mitigation. But I think if, if given the choice, the mitigation question is more urgent than the adaptation one. Uh, not to, to make light of it, but Sooner or later, we'll have to deal with sea level questions, and I will come back to that in a moment. But what we really need to do now is find those things which help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and that is uh, probably the more critical issue to, att to address more quickly. So having the measurement structures in place, or at least some measurement structures in place that we can use going forward, I think is really uh, a high priority. As far as the... Um, uh, adaptation questions are concerned. The sea level questions are interesting because the science, as is the case in, uh, in a lot of the uh, issues associated with climate change, the science is evolving rapidly. 
But one of the aspects of science, the nature of the scientific process, is such that it will tend to homogenize or tend to find the middle uh, place within the structure of the scientific literature, and that's absolutely the case with the IPCC work being done uh, globally. What it doesn't necessarily reflect is, is um, the, uh, rap the rapidity with which things are changing. In other words, uh, if we look back uh, over the last 10 years and look at the different scientific reports that have talked about sea level, what we find is that there is a, what's a, a sort of a common theme is that, that there is a um, theme in the sense of under predicting what is in fact happening, or, or to put it another way, an acceleration of the effect, because the, if, if you have a dynamic effect, or a, what is sometimes called a positive feedback loop, which positive means in the sense of the physics, not so much the sense of a value judgment, but as those things happen, it's hard to capture the dynamic of something that's changing rapidly. And there is some evidence that that is happening uh, in terms of sea level issues. And so predictions that might have looked reasonable 10 years ago don't look so reasonable now as we go forward in time. So I just raise that in terms of an adaptation question. Really, the point of that ramble for you, I think, would be that we need to be mindful of those changes and, again, set up structures that provide accurate an adequate measurement of them as opposed to getting the prediction right. I, I don't know that we're smart enough in this day to really know how those predictions will unfold, but I think we have plenty of evidence to know that they will and to have the right structures in place to measure them and begin to look at them is probably the most important aspect of this work at this time, at least in my judgment. Um, I think that whatever the elements uh, or whatever the plan looks like going forward, uh, as my earlier correspondence to you indicated, I think there's several areas that are important to address. Um, the one that really comes uh, within the framework of uh, traditional comprehensive planning is the land use and transportation element. And again, I think most of you are aware, but for the record, I would point out that in Washington state, uh, most of the greenhouse gases that are emitted are emitted as a result of transportation activity, and it's about 60% of the greenhouse gases emit emitted overall. So to the extent that we can come up with linkages that simply help us reduce the number of miles we drive because we don't have to, or the number of transportation, uh, or the number of emissions as a result of transportation, that's a good step and one that we want to be taking. And the more that we can link density and Again, uh, uh, Mary's presentation covers those. I think trying to build those into the plan are important. The other issues uh, associated with sea level, I think, are somewhat self-evident. Some that are not quite so self-evident have to do with water. We have and, li and are, are uh, fortunate to live in an area that has a pretty significant supply of water. And as Commissioner Oliver's knows, certainly better than I, uh, that water resource is driven at least largely by rainfall here as opposed to some other sources. However, the secondary impacts associated with a, uh, a region, a state, and a world that's going to be looking more and more for water supply is one that we should be mindful of. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like going forward, but what I am sure is that the, uh, that if the trends continue, and I have every reason to believe that they will, then water supply will be a significant issue going forward for other parts of this state and other areas and regions of the world. And so the fact that we have a supply will mean that we should perhaps look at it uh, more critically and uh, strategically. Uh, other issues also associated, uh, obviously storm events are part of that, but food supply I think we're seeing more and more uh, elements of disruption within what we've traditionally looked at as food supply, and frankly, I think it underscores the importance of having and trying to develop as much local agricultural capacity as possible. Again, we are blessed with a relatively large 
uh, still a relatively large agricultural element within our community and a water supply uh, to irrigate it. So I think those are pluses for the Northwest region. Uh, infrastructure was mentioned, and I think that's important both from the standpoint of developing strategies that reduce greenhouse gases by having our infrastructure and land use linked, but it also is uh, a, a, the need to look at vulnerabilities within our infrastructure and the costs that will be associated with addressing infrastructure changes. Uh, large and small. I think, again, uh, staff has correctly pointed out that we probably don't know what all of those look like at this point, but, but at least setting out a course to try to identify and look at more detail, I think, would be a correct course. I um, uh, would like to just wrap up by saying that uh, there's a couple of sources, um, but I, uh, one of the articles that I think I provided, I'm pretty sure I provided, and if not, would ha be happy to do so, is something called Climate Stopping Distance. It's a relatively short article uh, written by Dr. Stephen Palumbi and published by the Brookings Institute, I think, in, in August. Um, in any event, uh, that really uses the concept of uh, the faster and harder you put on the brakes, the, the more greenhouse gases you reduce. It's, it's kind of an obvious statement, but it's, it's, it's one that, it, it's a principle that can be applied here, and I, and I would suggest that it should be. And then there's an organization that's based in, their base is in Seattle, I believe, but I think they have, off, I know they have offices in Seattle and Olympia, and it's called Climate Solutions, and they have an entire group dedicated to just helping develop local climate action plans, and I would suggest that they might be a very good resource to look at in terms of uh, informing and providing you with some resource uh, and providing the staff with some resource capacity to help develop this next step. And I would say wearing the hat uh, of a city council member, um, I think it's probably more important that we get started than we get perfect. I think getting the right elements in place and the right measurements and structures in place are the most important things we can do right now. We know, for instance, that we will be looking at our shoreline master plan update uh, some few years uh, forward. It'll give us, I think, another opportunity to take advantage of uh, the good work that's being done nationally as well as uh, locally and regionally. So again, I think getting the right elements started now, getting the right measurements started now, getting commitments and looking at policies. I invite you to be bold, but I, I don't think this will be the last time we'll have conversations on it. So thank you so much for the work you've done. I want to really, again, thank the staff. I think they've given you some excellent information, and I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, look forward to the work that you're doing. Uh, <clears throat> I want to expand on one comment you made about um, um, I think you're probably referring to modeling when you were talking about the science that doesn't uh, do well with rapid change. And more importantly, models being constructed on past observations um, don't address any kind of a phase change whatsoever. And um, those tend to be things that scientists discover um, when, they are, when they finally happen. They see them after the fact. Oh, something happened that caused, now we're into a new state. And uh, we're going to go forward with a completely different model. You can take all the old models and throw them away because they are not uh, meaningful or they don't apply in this particular set of circumstances. Some have suggested that there are uh, points along the spectrum uh, with regard to climate uh, dynamics that could uh, cause state changes, and um, we don't have any models for that sort of thing. Well said. Uh, you know, it, as uh, I, I think Commissioner Jordison was pointing out, I'd love to have that one or two actions that we could take. Well, if I put on my hat as an economist, and I, I have worn that hat, uh, I'd, I'd say the number one thing you could do is price carbon. I mean, just if you step back for a moment and put the politics aside, the obvious decision you would make is to price carbon and ramp that so that it would be a slow ramp, relatively speaking, and allow the private sector to respond. 
Uh, in terms of the science, I think it's continuing to, to follow the best available science, uh, but the challenge that we all have is that anyone who, and I know a number of you have, spent any time with scientific disciplines, you realize very quickly that the moment you answer a question, there are a dozen more to be asked as a result of the exploration. This, there's no such thing as, a per, as perfect science. We, we do know with great certainty now these processes are unfolding and enough certainty by far to know that we need to respond to them. Uh, I also, I, I forgot to mention, but I think it's important. Um, I, I think that there is a new opportunity for us that I hope will be in, in the plan draft that you propose. I call it economics. Uh, it's very clear that energy technologies, energy efficiencies, water technologies, engineering technologies, uh, new technologies are going to be needed, new products are going to be needed, and they're going to be needed on a global scale. When I think of the regions of this nation, or for that matter, the world, it's hard to imagine a better region or a region uh, uh, better situated to respond to those global needs than this one. We have a land base in, in southwest Everett and in Snohomish County in particular, the largest manufacturing center in the state of Washington, and that manufacturing center is, I don't believe, or just maybe arguably over 50% at capacity. We have an educated workforce. We have a highly technical workforce. We have research and development capacity in our backyard between two wonderful universities, to say nothing of lots of other education institutions. Um, if we are in proximity, closely aligned to uh, Asia, which is obviously a huge market for these resources and products and technologies, uh, to quote Russell Wilson, why not us? Uh, and we need to have uh, economic capacity that is uh, counter-cyclical to aerospace. Uh, if there was ever an opportunity, it seems, that's facing, that's sort of in our backyard, it, it would be to develop these technologies. Oh, and I didn't mean to ignore the PUD in terms of one of the best national resources in terms of uh, clean energy and uh, new technologies for energy. It seems to me that the capacity to do this is really within, right in our backyard, and I'm hoping that we will use and take that as an opportunity to develop that capacity uh, for the economic benefits as well as the environmental ones. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Paul? You took one of my three questions away, and that's wh where does technology fit into this, so thank you for answering that. Um, when you talk about transportation and miles, where does congestion fit in? Because it's my understanding that the miles are miles, and that's X amount of greenhouse gases that get evaporated. But where is there data that shows when you're setting in traffic? You know, if I leave here and go to Seattle now, it's 25, 35 minutes. But when I do it tomorrow at 7, it's... 135 or 45 minutes, <laughs> uh, same amount of miles. Um, so I, I, I think the public and, and everyone, I, I think if some data, if, if you know a source that could be brought forward to help um, the public understand that that traffic congestion has a, a gigantic effect on this whole climate change issue as, as well, I, I, I we get wrapped around miles because that's a unit of measure. But um, so, I, is there data out there that? That's a that's just a great question. Um, I I I think the answer to that is yes. I think there are two sources, if not three, that I would uh, um, refer you and and staff to. One is Puget Sound Clean Air Agency. I do think that there has been some work done on. Uh, you know, in other words, if you burn a gallon of gas, this is what your emission rate is. Now, I, I think that's probably relatively true whether you're actually going anywhere or not. So the other dimension of the measurement is how many miles you're actually traveling in that gallon of gas, and if you're sitting in traffic for hours, not so much. So the other part of that is the, 
the equation of how far are you actually going when you burn that gallon uh, or whatever the fuel may be. I, uh, the second would be, I believe Climate Solutions probably has some modeling on this. Um, I, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there is something that to, to help answer the question there. And the third may be the Department of Ecology or some others that have been doing some work on Gallons it. per hour measurement. It, it absolutely is. And, and of course, if you're sitting in traffic, and now the, the other part of that is that we happen, sadly, to be in a, in a system now that is so extremely fragile that any activity that, that creates a bottleneck creates now a problem that is that can be certainly uh, a, a, a impact huge sub-elements of the system, if not the entire system. So uh, we're way behind the curve on building the alternatives. That's why some of us are so dedicated to try to move forward with ST3. I'm the sound transit systems or something other than an, a, a vehicle, a single occupancy or even multiple oc occupancy vehicle to provide that alternative. Um, but, you know, those are long lead capital uh, processes, but your question is a very good one and probably one that ought to be looked at in terms of developing the metrics. Thank you. The, the other one is there uh, was a study put out uh, about two weeks ago by the University of Washington that said something to the effect that, you know, the, the, the global warming or the water uh, warming on the West Coast uh, was not uh, uh, a product of, of humans' uh, activities. Right. And, I, and that, you know, how, how do you, as the, unfortunately, there seems to be sides and, um, you know, UW is certainly putting out a lot of data on climate change that says this, and then they come out with a study like that, and it it really uh, it dilutes us moving it f forward because it would just created a, a simple path for oh I, I knew I knew I was right it's not me it's it's the world or or whatever right I, you know it I I have uh, I've not read the study. Uh, I, I've read uh, two articles on it. Um, uh, if I understood them correctly, and, and I, I freely admit I'm not uh, a, an expert in that regard, but if I understood the article, if the articles were accurate and understood them correctly, the authors of the study were the first people to point out we're not saying that uh, that the, the greenhouse gas effect and climate I I actions aren't happening. What we're saying is that there are natural phenomenon in the warming, uh, whether that's the Pacific Oscillation, the El Nino-La Nina effect, and so on and so forth, that are also at play. And that's absolutely true. I mean, the reality is that we're talking about a uh, intersection of man-made activity in natural systems. And um, it's why almost everybody I know who, and everyone I've read about in this field have, will quickly point out that an individual event or an individual action cannot be attributed to climate change. Trends can be, warming can be, but events cannot be. And w we, have, uh, we have good data to show that the oceans have warmed and cooled, and the result of which is changes in the jet stream and so on and so forth. How much of that is attributed now to loading the atmosphere with greenhouse gas and heat-trapping heat gases? Uh, we have some good data and some good projections. But is it entirely that? Probably not. And so the question is, how do these big world events intersect. And, and I think that's obviously a place where more science and more research is uh, warranted and appropriate. That's the best answer I can give. I, I get that uh, the, the human capacity for self-deception might be boundless, but the uh, issues <laughs> nonetheless are real. And the question is to get the best science possible. And the best science still does, and even the authors of this report were quoted as saying, we're not trying to argue that climate change isn't happening. We're trying to get a better handle on what these natural processes are. And that's a fair question. And it should, be, it should continue to be a fair question as we explore and go forward. Thank you. Other questions for Councilman Roberts? Yeah. Paul, my questions are going to be from a slightly different tact because what I am taking away from your comments is that we need to create circumstances in the city of Everett that create a tipping point for our community in 
um, in creating an environment or leading towards an environment where we are making substantial headway in the areas of limiting greenhouse gases through transportation and land use planning. So am I correct in that? Was that a good well, summary? I think that's a fair assessment. If, if we want to take action before we, if we want to take action first because it's most important um, and, and be doing the scientific collection of data alongside of that, how do you, or what advice would you give us as we consider this going forward about incentivizing or creating policy or going through our policies and our land use, looking for opportunities to create those action opportunities? What, how would you, how would you go about that? Well, you know, the, the good news uh, first is that uh, the city has done some things. It's not as though we just have, in the last year, said, oh, gosh, this is sort of something we better do. I mean, I, and I, I really am proud of the work we've done to, for instance, look at corridors, look at higher capacity and higher density. Um, uh, so I, I think trying to move that forward in appropriate ways is important and incentivize. I, I, I get that there will be some pushback from some. Uh, that uh, we may be overreaching, but I do think it's appropriate to build um, uh, higher density and have higher energy standards for building. That's a big source of greenhouse gas emissions. I, I personally believe that putting more energy or at least putting emphasis on the mitigation side of this equation is important. Um, building the transportation systems and pushing for better public transit uh, you know, uh, but on the good news side, the most traveled public transit activity that we have is the Swift bus. It's over 5,000 riders a day. Those people are, and, and most of those boardings are within the city of Everett. So I don't think, I mean, I guess that's my way of saying, you know, we're doing some good things. So the, the key is to keep doing those good things by uh, providing uh, housing opportunities and incentivizing. There are some incentives that we've used them in some places, both in the downtown core and along Evergreen Way. Um, I think it may be time to look at, and maybe if, maybe part of this is to ask the legislature for, you know, it's tough to ask the legislature for money, but it might not be so tough to ask them for approval to give us incentives. Uh, or to use the incentives that we have to uh, build development that is uh, energy efficient. Uh, it, may be at the, it may be time to say that if you're going to get these tax incentives, you, sh you really have to have buildings that are that efficient. I mean, to some degree, that may already be happening. But if it isn't, that's an area. Um, the city has done some good things as a corporate entity, but I think it may be time to say, you know, we're at a, t at a time and place that it's now time to, if we're, if if we're going to get approvals for a building and structures and development, that they need to meet energy standards. And these are not hard standards to meet. It, it, I mean, these are not codes that are hard to meet anymore. And, and the good news is, again, in our backyard, the Home Builders Association has done some remarkable work in energy efficient development. We should be taking advantage of that and trying to build that into our codes if it's not already there. And, and to some degree it may be. I, I don't know the answer to that question. So I think the key is to look at places where we can, again, if we do the metrics, look at where we're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's going to be in transportation and building primarily, with the greatest being transportation, and trying to find ways to address that. Now, the congestion, it, it's tough. It, it, the city of Everett doesn't make decisions in terms of transportation funding. We try to live with them, but we don't make them. So part of that is to try to build this into the discussion that we have with our legislators and uh, both at the national uh, as well as at the local level to try to provide those incentives. I mean, the reality is that we're trying to deal with policy issues that are much bigger than the city of Everett. So the question is, where can we work around the margins and be prepared when, and I believe it's when rather than if, uh, we'll see more uh, policy incentives and initiatives at a state and federal level to address these issues. I'm sorry, I, I wish I could say it's this and this and this, but it's, it's not quite so clean. I understand the complexity of the issues and that we're dealing with a global 
really a global event that we see a very small slice of. But, you know, when we have our discussions here in a very tiny room in a very tiny place on the globe, we struggle with parking standards. We struggle with landscaping standards. We struggle with a very small bit of minutia that um, helps us govern how we allow the city to be developed. Rooftop gardens. Are we, are we at a place in our thinking that if we demand that all new buildings in the city of Everett be LEED standard certified um, and that every, if we're building maximum density in our downtown core, every top of the building should be a rooftop garden and as mitigation for, you know, in a small way um, for building um, massive building that's going to create a heat trap over our downtown area. I mean, are, are we at a point where we can politically start to discuss some of these ideas and, and, and bring them forward on to city council and, and for consideration? Well, you know, as a guy who spent a lot of years as a regulator, uh, I, I'm, I'm always a little careful to suggest that we should do something in all places in all ways. Mm -hmm. But I, I would suggest that there, and I believe, and I just personally believe that incentives are much better uh, tools than uh, hard regulations. But I would suggest, for instance, that trying to work with the PUD to incentivize uh, solar uh, energy uh, might be uh, as good an alternative as trying to put rain gardens everywhere. Uh, you know, I, I get, I get that the, there's some different objectives here, but if, if one were to say that the meta principle here is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then I would have to say that finding ways to move people in something other than a single occupancy vehicle and finding ways to heat homes or heat buildings in something other than uh, even though we have a, an abundance of hydropower in something other than, you know, sort of traditional fashions uh, that reduce or that emit greenhouse gases would maybe be the better priority. Thank you. Paul, well, uh, you know, I was listening as you answered uh, Michelle's question and you start, you used the word appropriate three times, I think I counted. And, uh, Better get rid of that word. <laughs> That's appropriate. I uh, sometimes I wonder if you know maybe we don't maybe the appropriate that who decides what's appropriate mm -hmm. you know and uh, mm -hmm. is it uh, you know like these these young people who chain themselves to old growth trees you know because they don't want to see them cut down you know a lot of people would say well that's inappropriate. I shouldn't do that, it's against the law. But, you know, I still admire them for, for doing that because they were willing to go out and risk getting arrested or, you know, um, and I'm kind of a little bit, you know, my, you probably sense my frustration that there's a lot of uh, appropriate stuff happening, but, you know, uh, at what point do we start to push the envelope a little bit and say, okay, well, Maybe we're, we're not going to worry so much about what's appropriate, and we're going to go ahead and do something and, and make a, a, a gesture. I, I guess uh, I, I'm not looking to uh, stir up trouble or anything like that. I just, uh, you know, I think what we need is a Warren Buffett to come to, you know, he has some pr pretty interesting ideas, you know, and he's got the money to back it up. But uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, and, and Michelle sort of re reiterated some, some questions that I had about what are we doing to put these incentives out there to really get, say, uh, a private entities to, to actually do a really uh, a sustainable design. And it's not just uh, climate change, but it's, you know, it's helping to prevent the extinctions of, of various species of animals and uh, endangered species and microenvironments and salmon and you know, uh, all, all these things, it's sort of a holistic thing, you know, and it, it almost seems like we're in sort of this, we're in a little bit of a runaway acceleration of all this, you know, because it, it, it very quickly, you know, you hear, the, you hear the, the warnings that, you know, we may just find out 
fairly soon that it's, it's too late. We can't do anything about it. So, you know, I'd like to, uh, you know, we, we, we have to sort of think outside the box a little bit. You know, we have to, we, we have to get, get out of our comfort level a little bit. And we have to challenge people who say, well, I don't think we should do that in the city of Everett because uh, nobody will want to come here and build an office building, you know. Well, you know, um, okay, so we didn't get that office building, you know. Uh, this, but but I, we, we have to really, this is really going to challenge our values, you know, in, in this regard. So um, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is maybe appropriate, maybe we have to start pushing what, you know, we have to decide, we have to decide what's appropriate, you know, f from within as, as opposed to from without, so. Yeah. My comment. I, I, I appreciate that. I, w we're operating as a city in, in the absence of a real policy at a national level and a policy at a state level. Um, I guess for me, uh, trying to, because it's easy to get overwhelmed and it's easy to, I, I think to me, it's try to make it as simple as I can for my own brain. And, and, and that is, if you can do things that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that's good. And if you can do things that look realistically at what uh, will unfold, because we know these things are gonna unfold, that's good. And uh, I, I think it's easy to get overwhelmed, and I, I, I personally think that is not a helpful reaction. What, not that you're saying that, but I mean that we as a society get overwhelmed because it, it's easy to do that, but it's also, I think, relatively clear that to separate the signal from the noise, and the signal is reducing greenhouse gases will help. We didn't get here by a few bad decisions. We got here by billions of decisions that were made in the absence of better information. We're now blessed with better information, and at least in many respects, these are challenges that we can plan for because there, are just, there is a certain degree of predictability to what is unfolding. I, I think we need to take advantage of that. And I think that every city, mine in particular, I hope, will begin that process. But there isn't a quick finish line and there probably isn't gonna be a quick solution. It's more a matter of getting started. Thank you. It, it seems to me that we've kind of been working around the edges, looking for opportunities. Uh, and, and possibly we're at a point now where we need to actually come up with a very targeted approach, uh, a strategic approach to, to coming up with positions, whether it be policies or regulations, so that we'll, if we use enhancements or investments or hard regulations, that we get a result, we somehow maximize the results that we can from that. And I'm not sure if, if the intention for the this element of the comprehensive plan is to come up with more than just a set of policies, but an actual plan. You know, some targets that we would achieve within five years or ten years, and then a, an approach to achieve those targets. I think my intent at this point is to come with the po policies that direct preparation of a climate action plan, you know, at a later date that includes some of these things that um, Mr. Roberts has been talking about. Um, but I don't think we're going to include, uh, be able to come up with all the actions as part of this element. Well, th this information the report has put together is just fantastic. I think this is great work. It was really helpful to go through and read it. But I would hope that maybe after the comprehensive plan work is done and that's completed, that we take the next step, which would be an action plan. And I don't know if that's initiated here at the planning commission level or the city council level or through some type of community forum, but I think that should we should kind of put that on our agenda mm -hmm. for later on that we, we need to start working on it. it, it Michelle, do you want to go to that? No, okay. I, you know, in terms of reviewing it, I think we can initiate it as a planning commission, a review process on that particular issue. And, and I think timing wise, I think you're, you're correct. I mean, once we get through the comprehensive plan update, I think it'd be an appropriate time to come back and circle around any of these issues that, that we identify while we go through the process. And I, 
So we certainly have the ability to do that as a planning commission, and city council and the mayor also have the ability to ask us to do it, but we can start it on our own, so. Mary, so I, I'm just going to paraphrase for my own clarification. When we put the, this element in the comp plan, you would like to take it to the directives for framing the discussion about how we will prepare an action plan, but not the action plan items themselves. Is that right? That's what I'm looking at right now. Okay, yeah. so um, if we were to say fictitiously, but as a, an example, we would, as a commission, like to look at our um, parking standards for multifamily housing vis-a-vis um, -vis the uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction that we could possibly get by limiting parking to one stall per unit or one and a half or whatever would be a reduction from our current standard. Uh, is that the kind of specific you're looking for at this level or is that still too detailed? No, that could go in the, I have some draft stuff like that in the element, like parking strategies for joint use, encouraging joint use or um, other ways to parking management strategies to eliminate parking, surface parking lots, things, maybe parking can be managed better. So actions like reducing standards for parking, we could clearly put that in the element or to consider, we should consider doing this or study that or, you know. Or even just stating that we will consider multiple, multiple strategies to um, with regards to the parking standard and not even having to name them specifically. We could do that too. Okay. All right, that helps me understand what we're trying to um, verbalize at this level. Thanks. Other comments, questions, staff? I, I sure appreciate the, the, the work that the staff has done putting this together, Mary. And, and Councilman Roberts, I, I think the first time you came to talk to us, we were talking about, you know, there's some off-the-shelf type of plans that we could put in place. And I appreciate the, the evolution of the discussion that the, the staff has led us on, that you've led us on, and helping us take this first step. And so uh, I'm kind of humbled, actually, by some of the questions that are asked, because uh, this is quite the, the learning process as you go through it in terms of impacts and economic opportunity and all the different things that come along with this as a first step. It's not simply uh, one issue that, that we deal with. So um, we're actually still, it, it's a workshop. Uh, Councilman Roberts, the only person that signed up to speak. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to us? Yes, yeah. if you'd step up to the podium, give us your name and address for the record. My name is Dean Smith. I live at 3007 Federal Avenue um, here in Everett. Um, most of you don't know me, so I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I have college degrees in mathematics, physics, and engineering, and I've spent 20 years working in the intelligence business in Washington, D.C. Uh, the last two of those years, I was a staff, a staff scientist at the National Security Council. I wasn't directly involved in climate effects in those years, but I attended a lot of briefings and read a lot of intelligence reports that ha had to do with climate change. I left there in 1978, a long time ago, but I know that at that time even, the, the intelligence people were very concerned about climate change effects in this century. So it's not a new thing by any means. I was working in those days in uh, modeling very complex uh, subjects. We thought we had some complex things to deal with then, <laughs> nothing like now. But what I want to speak about tonight is my own experience in Everett. Um, we moved here from Edmonds, we sold a bigger house, we bought a smaller house here, and we had extra money left over. So I decided at that time to uh, invest that money in solar. And we put a five kilowatt solar array on, our, on a roof of a building that was built in uh, 1901. It actually looks pretty good uh, up there. I want to tell you about our experience with that and why I did it and, and kind of how I regard the world and our role in it because I think it might be enlightening. Um, we wanted to, we, it's, it's a duplex house. There's an apartment upstairs and we live downstairs. 
and we wanted to share the power with the upstairs apartment, and we found out on the day of installation that we couldn't do that. The PUD rules and so forth w wouldn't support us in doing that. So it was like a roadblock right put in front of us, kind of uh, in surprise. Uh, so I made a snap decision to put all the panels on our downstairs meter, and uh, we proceeded that way. Our experience since then, and it's been five years ago that we did this, so we have quite a bit of experience. Um, we have not had an electric bill, period, in five years. Every month our net bill has been negative. Uh, the way the PUD and the state subsidy system works is we get a 15 cent per, per kilowatt hour subsidy from the state until 2020 for what we did. And uh, that's the lowest you can get now, by the way, because at that time there were no Washington State built equipment, so we had to use Philippine equipment to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> so not only have we not had an electric bill, we get the first few years we got about $900 back annually from the PUD because we had put so much more power into the system than, than we used, okay? So we've gotten kind of, kind of lax about our conservation over those five years. We've started using a little more electricity for heat. We were using natural gas, now we're using more electricity. We put in a hot tub, that took some <laughs> electrical energy. And last year we bought an electric car. So we we're fueling it up on the roof of the house, so to speak. Uh, the way I regard this whole thing is that we are using the PUD and Bonneville and the Columbia River as a battery, right? We charge it up. I mean, we put energy into the system during the day. We take some out at night because we charge the car at night. This year, with, with all that load, with the car, the hot tub, the uh, electric heat and so forth, we only got $200 back. Still no electric bill, but only $200. Back. So it can be done here in the Northwest. Um, you were asking about things that, that we need to look at. Um, you know, we, we need to look at where our traditional immigration into this area is coming from and, and ask what's going on in those areas that could make people come here, like California, Eastern Washington. Um, and my wife... Um, works here in town. I'm retired, so I can work anywhere. Um, she, could ride a, she could ride a bike to work, you know, but she won't do that because she doesn't feel safe. We were in Amsterdam this summer, spent several days in Amsterdam, and I was very impressed at the number of bicycles there, and I was very impressed at the, at the bicycle streets that were there. On all but the most minor streets, bicycles were separated from the street by at least a curb, and sometimes more. And I saw every manner of people riding bicycles there. It was the middle of summer. I saw young career women in their dresses with high heels riding bicycles. Um, everybody, children, old men, everybody riding bicycles. More bicycles than people in Amsterdam. And they felt safe doing it. Um, Bicycles have the right of way over everything there, everything. And even pedestrians, <laughs> you better watch out on a sidewalk because a, a bike has the right of way. So we could do things here in Everett to make biking safer and I don't think that a, a white line painted down the street is much protection. And my wife doesn't think so either and that's why she won't ride her bike. I want to also mention here uh, the elephant in the room, I think. And that is that we are right in the pathway of an enormous amount of fossil fuel transport. And that's, you know, we're, we're, coal is going through our city, going to China and being burned to, to come back over here in the form of pollution. We have crude oil now, two trains a day, usually at night, going through Everett carrying, carrying crude oil that's adding more CO2 to the air. And the city hadn't even taken a position on this, to, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, most, many other cities on the path have. I would admonish you that most of those oil trains go right through the tunnel and down through the transit center 
and right through the areas where you're proposing to have high density population. Uh, that sounds like a formula for a problem to me. So I don't know what you want to do about it, but uh, I'm concerned about it. I wouldn't, I live three blocks from the tracks right now, and, and I'm very concerned about that. I would like to see this, the fire department having evacuation drills for us because, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, I was talking to a fellow from Lac Magognac in Quebec where 47 people died. And uh, he was a very sad fellow. Um, and, the, and the problems continue there. So anyway, that's my input as a citizen. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak? Okay. Uh, okay. Having no other uh, speakers, any uh, questions or comments from uh, from the commission at this point? Oh, I'm sorry, Victor. I didn't realize you if you were coming up or head out the door. So, go ahead. If you give us your name and address for the record and. Victor Harris, 3017 Lombard, beautiful downtown Everett. One of the things that comes to mind here, Mr. Smith is lucky. He had that extra investment. He could, he could do his solar panels. And I think about it, a lot of people may not have that money. It seems to me that the PUD should have that money or that resource. When we do a new project, a new housing project that's a block long, both sides, if we're not going to put solar panels on each house, then maybe along the alley there should be a solar farm. A lot of people say, well, I don't want solar on my house, but they'll buy it from the PUD no matter what, what it is, whether it's water or wind. And I think that might be a way to make it affordable to put in these alternatives. PUD still owns it. They get the revenue instead of having to pay Mr. Smith. Those kind of things. They'll get their money back. I think it might be an option to look at that way is to say what, you know, if the PUD can make the major projects and the major investments, we can see that change. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. All right. Comments or questions from uh, the commission on our item? Thank you, everybody. I appreciate uh, the, you know, reviewing this and the, and the work the staff put in and all the questions and stuff. Um, so it'll be, we'll get another update on November 18th on this topic, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. So great. Thank you. Any housekeeping items, Dave? Any questions on uh, anything uh, housekeeping related? Okay, great. We'll go ahead and adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, just in one comment, the hotel started construction next door, so you probably saw that if you tried to drive there. So that's uh, um, it's been um, long in the coming in the sense of being able to finance that and such, but it's now moving ahead, and so the road will be shut down. So you have to – parking's a little tight tonight. I, th I think you must have a hockey game tonight or something, too. So, Right. Okay. Thanks, Dave. We'll go ahead and adjourn.